If you're just joining us, uh, welcome to Strategies for Enhancing Instructor Presence in your online course. So we do have some different goals for this workshop today. Um, hopefully we're gonna come up with some new strategies for how you can communicate effectively with your students, show your students that you are present and available. Uh-oh. Is anybody else having audio trouble? I can hear. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so it looks like it's um, localized. That's good. Well, for the rest of us. All right. So we'll we'll wait and see if Nahal can join us um, again. I know I had audio problems earlier when I connected, so um, patience, I, I think, is is what we need here with Collaborate today. Uh, but then again, just to go back to our goals, um, we do want to show our students that we're present, you know, how can we uh, lead by example, and then, of course, how can we support our students' overall course success. All right, so it looks like I think everybody is um, logged in. If you want to go ahead and type in the text chat, or if you feel more comfortable with your microphone, you can always hop on the microphone, but um, maybe if you could just introduce yourself. Tell us your name, what is it that you teach, um, and then to kickstart some of the conversations, what makes a strong, positive teacher impression? So I'll give you guys just a moment to type in the chat. Welcome. Um, if you're joining or just rejoining the session, um, there's just a, a quick prompt up on the screen for you. If you just want to type in the text chat, you can get to know each other a little bit. Oh, good. I see all of the responses pouring in. Um, so, of course, you can read through these as well, but for the recording, I'll try to read through some of these as well. Michelle is from the Department of Marketing and the College of Business, and this semester you're teaching integrated marketing communications, database marketing, and mining. Ooh. Um, and new this semester is the career planning course. Excellent. I'm just reading through all these responses here. Kurt is teaching MPA budgeting and capstone courses and a strong positive impression is from early and continuous engagement with each student. Excellent. All right, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit because I know there's so many coming in. Let's see. Oh, Carrie, another English composition instructor. Excellent. I think ex engagement and responsiveness makes a good impression. Being approachable, excellent. So sometimes it's about strategy and sometimes it's about, you know, personality as well. Great. All right, well, while some more of those are coming in, I think we can kind of move on. So there will be some opportunities for all of you to share some ideas in the text chat throughout this workshop. So we're gonna start off with that. 
In your online course specifically, how do you approach, and if you just want to pick one or two of these, that's fine. Um, how do you approach communicating effectively with your students? How do you approach showing your students that you are present? Or how do you approach supporting your students' success? Welcome, Nahal. Welcome, Rabab. Hopefully, um, audio is coming through for both of you. If anybody's having tech problems, we are recording this session, and I'll be happy to share that with you at the end. Great, I'm seeing all these different responses come in. Um, so you try to answer student emails as soon as you can, especially for online courses. Yes, email is a primary mode of communication. Excellent. Um, showing presence is from being present in the discussion boards and also through regular announcements. Yes, we're gonna touch on a, a bunch of these topics that I see coming in. Well, I think if we're going to start, great. Oh, I see a couple more. Visual illustrations for the course topics. Excellent. Engaging students in discussion. Camera and microphone on. Excellent. So if we're going to talk about instructor presence, then we should probably kind of break this into pieces and, and look at all the different components. And we also need to talk about set it and forget it. Um, some of you may have heard of this concept, but a lot of pre-planning is involved with online courses. Um, it's something very distinct to this modality of instruction. So instructors often have to think about their lesson plan in detail so that they can get it set up in the LMS or in Blackboard. And so one of the temptations that can arise from that is that you do all this pre-planning, you set up the course, um, and then once your students get in there, you may think that everything is good to go and your students will know how to navigate the course and the course materials. Um, and what we've learned from students is that they have different questions along the way. They might navigate your course differently than how you navigate your course. Um, so they might have questions about where to find things. And so we, we've we learned that we have to resist this temptation to think that once the course is set up, it's complete. Uh, we still have to engage with our students um, deliberately from day one through the end of the course. So what are these components of instructor presence? Well, there's three main pieces here. Um, the persona, the social presence, and then the instructional presence. Now, your persona is you, who you are as an individual, and it's your personality. I've heard students sometimes in the past say, oh, you know, I think, I think there's a man who teaches my course. Um, and this tells me that if they're not entirely sure who the instructor is, that something got lost along the way. Um, they, don't, they don't really see their instructor as a unique individual. Um, and so we really want to convey that in an online course. 
the social presence is what the instructor has done to facilitate this sense of community in the course. And this part is about deliberate actions. How are the students going to connect with each other, their peers, um, and also how they're going to connect with you as the teacher. And then of course, the third part, the instructional presence. Uh, this is how you are a unique instructor in your course. You know, what are your policies? What are your procedures? You know, what is your method of organization? And so these three different components are, are all related to how your, your students view you as, um, you know, a unique instructor presence. Okay, so I have one other question, I think, in this workshop, but I, I wanted to put this in the chat for you um, because I think a lot of us come to online teaching after we, we became face-to-face -face instructors. So um, sometimes it's helpful to think about it from this angle. How would you communicate or show your presence and support your students in a face-to-face -face environment? And then the part, the second part to this question is, how is that different in an online setting? And again, if you prefer the microphone, please feel free to hop on the microphone. Okay, so Carrie says eye contact, moving around the, the room, body language in general. Sure, that's that in-person contact, right? And, and Kurt has noticed that discussions are fluid in face-to-face, -face, but they can feel stilted or halted in an online environment. Sam noted that, you know, you can connect with students before class begins, right, as they're filing into the classroom or, you know, talking and chatting during breaks. Sure. Particularly true if students keep their cameras off. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the positive note, Carrie noted that students do like to approach after class with questions. So I don't really think that one modality of instruction is better than the other. I do think they're different. Um, so one thing that we can note here is sometimes in an online environment, um, students may actually, particularly students who identify as being kind of shy or introverted, um, they may feel better able to express themselves in an online environment. Um, so there are, are definitely some opportunities there. Um, and, and they may wait until maybe even after a synchronous session to ask questions or, you know, if they're shy um, and have difficulty with public speaking, sometimes text chats work well for this. So let's talk about some of those ideas. And some of these I think you've already brought up in the discussion, but we're, we're gonna give you some specific strategies today to expand on these. One of the things that we know about an online environment is that you have to kind of facilitate this group communication right away. Um, and so it's beneficial if you set this up from the very first day of class, or even if it's an asynchronous course, if you've divided maybe your content into modules, um, having some type of a discussion forum right away. 
you know, you can encourage students to share photos and videos um, and to also require these peer responses. Now, with that being said, it is a great idea to lead by example. And what we've learned from students is that they respond um, far stronger to videos than just simple photographs. So if you could maybe even start the discussion board with embedding a, a quick welcome video, um, students tend to relate to this uh, far more than if you just post you know, a picture and, and tell a little bit about yourself. So I do encourage you, if you've never tried posting a video, um, to insert one in your course. Carrie asked, would you recommend assigning an intro video then? I think that might be a great idea. Um, and if you need some resources on how students can maybe use like our, our video platform, Kaltura, um, please let me know. I'll be happy to share that also um, in a follow-up email to this workshop. So um, right away, students will know, oh, I need to record a video, but oh, I have resources and I know how to use the, the video recording function. But absolutely, don't be shy about asking them to, to engage like that. Um, another thing that's really great is to host a synchronous session. Now, some of you may be teaching asynchronously, and if that's the case, you can offer a first optional synchronous session. You may not get a lot of attendance, uh, but you could still record it and post it for your students. And that's another great way for them to hear your voice, your inflection, see your face, maybe on, on video, um, as well as include an icebreaker activity. I think sometimes we dive straight into a synchronous session on the first day of class and we say, let's go look at the syllabus. Um, so don't forget to to do some type of activity to engage them. We, do, we don't want our online students just being passive and sitting there. So um, ask them to, to share something even in the text chat, but um, come up with an activity just to, to get them involved. And we're gonna have a little bit more on this. I have some specific suggestions coming up, um, but the other idea is to come up with a welcome assignment or survey. And this is where you ask students to self-identify some of their specific needs, uh, maybe challenges that they've encountered in the past, and then even goals for, their, for this particular course. So, um, and I promise I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail on that coming up. But these are some things that I, I highly recommend either for module one or, you know, maybe you have a start here module for your students when they enter your, your course. Um, so these are all great things to start off the, the course so that they feel kind of connected and energized and, and they, they've, you know, kind of developed some sort of a relationship with you. So the second part to this is the sustaining engagement, right? We don't want to fall into that trap of the set it and forget it mentality. Um, so here are some different things that we can work on in the course. Provide opportunities for students to get to know each other. Some of you had mentioned, um, I, I think, um, spending some time getting to know each student one-on-one. -on -one. Also think about how students are going to get to know their peers. If you have group work, switch up maybe the groups and, and allow them to interact with different individuals uh, throughout the course. You can also do something where you share something personal about yourself just so that they, they see you as a person instead of a figurehead. Um, I had one instructor who said, I really wanted to record a welcome video, but I ran out of time. So she's like, I turned on my uh, webcam while I was walking my dogs. And she was just like, and, and the student response was overwhelming. They absolutely loved that while she welcomed them to the course, they watched this dog that kind of looked like a little potato on a leash, you know, like walking down uh, the sidewalk in front of them. So uh, there's lots of opportunities. It, it doesn't have to be anything elaborate or staged. Um, but maybe talk to them about your interests or hobbies, you know, just a quick blurb so, so that they get to know you. Um, express interest in their lives as well. Um, encourage them to share some of that um, in those welcome, welcome boards. We also wanted to develop these connections. And so we'll, we've often heard this, you know, um, what are these transferable um, skills or, or knowledge? How does something that they learned in a prerequisite course, you know, relate to this class? Or how can they take your course and apply it elsewhere in, in other courses? Um, see if students can make that connection on their own. 
can they apply what they're learning in your course to their professional lives? So um, look for those opportunities. And then of course, articulate those common college expectations. So if you have certain standards on professionalism, uh, tell them you know, why they, they need to know this and, and how it helps them um, in future situations as well. There may be an opportunity um, in this kind of third bucket over here to connect course policies to professional expectations. That doesn't always um, translate. I, I think personally for me, because I was in a liberal arts background, I was like, oh, you know, English didn't necessarily translate to a specific career field. Um, but again, I, I was able to talk about maybe soft skills, um, things like professionalism and communication and, and how that would apply in a variety of situations. So if you can help your students make those connections, they are more likely to uh, really just retain some of your, your course content that you're reviewing, um, and they're also going to place a higher value on their education. Okay, so now we wanna get into some of these very specific strategies. Um, so I have mixed in here some strategies as well as some functionalities uh, within Blackboard because I think that's helpful as an instructor to know how to execute these different uh, methods of communication. So one of them is of course announcements. Now, when you set up announcements in Blackboard, I do highly recommend that you also send it as an email. Uh, students are, are likely getting emails on their cell phones. Um, so this is a great way to try to catch their, their attention. I would also recommend that you make sure that you've scheduled um, your announcements with some sort of frequency. I think it's possible that you can send emails too often and students get inundated with them. Uh, we have to remember that they're enrolled in other courses and so they're likely receiving um, a variety of announcements from their other classes. So um, we want to kind of strike this balance, right? Not too many um, and not not too sporadically that uh, they, they feel disconnected from the course. So um, a nice way to think about this is if you do weekly modules or something like that, you can send them welcomes and, and let them know that a new module has opened. Uh, similarly, you may want to send emails um, to remind them of upcoming deadlines. So, um, you know, if things are typically due on Sundays in your course, you might want to send out that reminder email on a Friday to give them uh, ample time to get in there to complete the assignments. You may even want to send announcements periodically when large assessments have been graded so that students can go in there to check their grades. So again, I, I've got this um, just a, a photo here of what this can look like. Um, make sure that you send messages and emails. Um, together. So there is a Blackboard messaging tool. Um, messages in Blackboard currently are set up that if um, students see the, the message as an email that they can't just um, respond uh, to the, the message. So you may want to instruct them to uh, respond directly to you via email. Um, so I usually like to, to give a little uh, line in there how you prefer them to, you know, if they have a follow-up question, how do you want them to communicate with you? Okay, so this is one of the other resources that I will send to you um, in the follow-up email. So this is NIU's website on regular and substantive interaction. So regular and substantive interaction is, well, it's the best policy and it's also a, um, a federal policy. So uh, we have some very specific guidelines for regular and substantive interaction. So there are three kind of components to this. Um, it has to be initiated by the instructor. It has to be um, regular and frequent. And then of course it has to be focused on the course content. So uh, even though we're trying to build a community with our students, you know, if we had a whole separate side conversation, you know, about sports or something like that, it would not qualify as regular and substantive interaction. 
So we do have some specific resources for this and suggestions on what meets regular and substantive uh, interaction guidelines for an online course uh, versus maybe, you know, kind of clarifying some of the myths about it. And uh, we're going to take a look at a couple of these too. So one of the ideas that I have for you is timely feedback. Now, when we think about timely feedback, I think that there are there's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, some of you have a lot of courses that you're teaching. Some of you might have really large rosters in your class. So I, I don't want to get hung up on the idea that there's um, a one, one size fits all approach for feedback and for grading. Um, but it is nice to come up with a policy that works for you and then to uh, reiterate this in your syllabus. So, for instance, you might have a two-week grading turnaround time. Um, that's a great way to express to your students your own workflow, and then you can also have some different communications about how you expect them to respond um, and, and what is the turnaround time expectations for their work. I think we had mentioned briefly uh, module uh, or videos. So this one is actually about the module overviews and videos. Um, I guess now's a, a great time to ask, do many of you organize your course content into weekly modules or, or some other method of, of organization similar to that? You can kind of type in the chat what you prefer. Yes, okay. So in lieu of that face-to-face -face interaction that maybe you're, you're missing uh, from a traditional classroom environment, sometimes you can just um, post a, a quick video in your modules and introduce students to it. Tell them a little bit about it. What are they going to do? Why is it important? Uh, where did you house specific items? Um, it, it is interesting when you think about how familiar you are with your own course, you know exactly what to click on and where to go. Um, and it can be astonishing how other people will navigate your course. Uh, they could be in all sorts of folders that you never anticipated. So um, it's a great way just to, to kind of direct the flow of traffic and to help students get acclimated uh, to your course. Great, Carrie, you, you've done something similar. You organize it by major assignments. That's another excellent method of organization. All right, so I have some um, ideas here for a specific communication plan. Now, um, we know that there are three kind of primary ways that we can communicate with our online students. Of course, there's email. Um, you could always try and schedule phone calls with them or you could do web conferencing sessions. And so we've got a, some different ideas on this. I do like to outline expectations for communication. And so this is actually a blurb that I pulled from a colleague's syllabus. Um, so this is not mine, but, but I think this is a good example. Um, you know, they, they talk about their professional background and then they have um, communication expectations for students, and then um, they said, this is what you can expect from me. And, and I think what's really nice about this is that they said they view their syllabus as a contract with their students. You know, I agree to, you know, uphold these policies, and this is my expectation for you. Um, so it's kind of a level of respect with the students that everybody has, has a part to play in, in this course. And, um, Again, I, I think that you are going to have specific policies for your course um, and whatever those are, if you can just outline them for your students. We do also have some different uh, options for grading. Now, this actually serves two functions. Um, this will help you with your grading workflow as an instructor. Um, but it also makes a large impression on your students. And so I really wanted to point this out. Um, so I took some screenshots here, and this is actually uh, what this looks like in the Blackboard gradebook. So uh, as you can see, there is um, something here, an essay question two, it was out of 100 points, so I could score that. Um, but then there's an opportunity to leave feedback for students. And I think 
Many of us still think about feedback um, in terms of written feedback, but there's also an option where you can record feedback for your students. And optionally, you can turn on your webcam. So if you don't want to turn on your webcam, you don't have to, uh, but you can talk through your feedback to students and you can record it audibly for, for them. Has anyone tried this feature yet? So my little red arrow that you see on the screen, um, that's actually pointing at the little um, camera icon. So you have to click on that and then you can decide whether or not you want to engage your webcam or not. Um, but this is built straight into Blackboard. If you've never tried it, I, I highly recommend it just even once to, to test it out. Um, you might be surprised how much faster you get through grading um, if you just record your feedback as opposed to typing it. Um, and this gives students another way to connect with you. They're going to hear your voice, you know, so if you were truly impressed with something they did in their presentation, you know, they can hear that excitement in your voice come through. Great. I'm glad that's something new for you. Lonely, um, you want to see what students see on their end. Um, let me see if I have a, a recording of what that looks like from the student perspective. If not, I'm I'm happy to um, play with that, and I can send you, you know, just like a, you know, a quick screenshot recording of what students experience on their end. Um, but I'm happy to provide that for you. Okay, and then my, my favorite one here is uh, the world is your classroom. So uh, Megan, I, I think often, yes. Just sorry to interrupt. Um, so going back to this last uh, slide, the previous slide. So do they they just hear your voice or are they, are they looking at the assignment as you talk? That's a great question. So to actually um, get the feedback, whether it's um, something that you've recorded or that you've written feedback, they students actually have to open the assignment first. So um, they they can see the assignment as well as listen to your feedback. So that's so what they they see my track changes or whatever or comments but then I can talk through and ex try and explain better what it is. Yes, correct. Got it. Thanks. Um, and that's a really, Kurt, that's a great question um, because I have heard sometimes faculty are saying like, my students don't know how to how to view my feedback, even if you just typed in your comments. Um, what some students may not realize is that they, no matter what, they have to actually open that assignment again before they can see the um, full feedback. I always have the impression they never read my comments anyhow, but you know what, if I have a voice, maybe they're not <laughs> actually looking, I don't know. I've actually heard um, it is on the uh, bucket list for Blackboard or Anthology, uh, whichever you call it. Um, they're they're looking to enhance that functionality so you can see how many students have actually viewed their feedback. So um, stay tuned for that. That should be a new feature request coming up somewhere in the new uh, in the new future, near future. Okay, um, so yes, just to go back to this one, I, I always say that the world is your classroom. Um, I think with online courses, sometimes we, we think about students in front of their, their computers or their laptops, and certainly that is true. Uh, but we know that students have a lot of mobile devices, and we know that our online learners they have a lot of different experience too. Uh, so it's really important to ask them to integrate some of their some of their life into their coursework. So it is a great idea to ask your students to uh, take a break from, from the computer and, and go out and interact with their environment and then um, report back with some of their findings. So um, there are a variety of options on how you can do this, um, whether it's a synchronous course or an asynchronous course. You know, if you have a synchronous session, you could ask your students to um, take a break from, from the class and, and give them a, a treasure hunt, you know, so to speak. 
Um, you can also ask students to, to bring in some of their resources. So if you find yourself as an instructor always providing the readings or providing materials or examples for students, ask them to go out and locate it um, and turn it into either a discussion board where everyone can see what they found um, or to maybe like a journal assignment if, if you prefer to give them more of a, like a, a personal reflection period. So uh, your online students, just remember, they, they could be in different time zones. They, they could be um, in different areas. They might not even be in Illinois. So um, I was in an online class uh, with somebody who was over in China. <laughs> so they were definitely in a different time zone. Um, but it's a really great opportunity to ask students, you know, kind of about their, their outside life and how it impacts their schoolwork. So if you can, can find that opportunity, I, I think students are really going to connect with you. And I know that some of you have some of the most creative ideas. So um, we've got our, our second, and I think it's our last chat question. But what is one creative way that you could facilitate a community building exercise in your online course? And you can label it whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. Or the, or the microphone, whatever you're comfortable with. And if anybody's looking for the microphone, it should be down at the bottom of your screen, uh, right in the center. Kurt, you have some group projects in every course. Do you have any um, specific recommendations for things that you think work well? Well, it's actually an MPA uh, core, uh, program competency. So almost all of our courses require some kind of group projects so that people learn how to work together even with a slacker and how do you deal with a slacker and because uh, that's the real world. So we, we have uh, multiple group projects and simulations that they work together and play role playing and that's synchronous and asynchronous versions of the same course. And in the capstone course, they are they have individual stuff to begin with the first couple of weeks, but then it's a group project presented in front of practitioners at the end. Excellent. I love this. Okay, and I see some more coming in. For a business writing course, ask students to write a mission statement for the class after studying the mission statements. Um, so that could be done in small groups online. Oh, I like that. Students will do a self-introduction presentation to help everyone get to know each other a bit. Wonderful. Use Flipgrid. I think it's now called Flip. Um, that might be, I haven't, I'll have to double check, Michelle. Uh, Flip might have gone to, um, it might be hidden behind a paywall now. So I'll have to check and see. Um, but that's kind of like a video tool where you can ask students um, for introductions or icebreakers. And students have to reply to two other students. Yeah, let me double check on that, Michelle. I'll, but I feel like I, I heard the rumor that, that Flip went to being hidden behind a paywall. Students in face-to-face -face love Kahoot. You know, you could still use Kahoot um, if you have a synchronous course as well. So that's a great idea. Okay, excellent. I've heard some other um, really interesting ideas from other faculty. So I, I would like to express that these are, are not from me. Um, so I don't wanna take credit for them. I've heard that nursing instructors during the height of the pandemic, um, remember when everybody was getting really creative with their um, personal protective equipment and they were coming up with new ways um, to create masks when they went to the grocery store. Um, so they asked students to go out there and find an example of somebody who um, engineered their own personal protective equipment and to um, rank it um, because these were health professionals, you know, was it actually effective or not? Um, so, so I thought that was really kind of creative. Um, the people were pulling up all sorts of, of really wild uh, YouTube videos, uh, people who were using like Halloween masks in the, 
in the stores. <laughs> so um, the, the health uh, students were able to weigh in on, on that debate. Um, I know there was a, a history instructor who um, was introducing virtual reality equipment to students. Uh, they were able to actually get a grant for this. And so when they would, would talk to students about, you know, atrocities, um, natural disasters, um, they in, then students could come in um, and sign up to use the virtual reality equipment um, and they could see what it felt like to uh, survive an earthquake. So um, lots of different ideas, you know, um, they, and then they had to talk with each other, you know, everybody who went through the simulation, what did you feel? What did you experience? Um, so, so lots of community building. There's a lot of creativity going on there. All right. We've got about 15 minutes left, so I think we're going to do really well on time here. Uh, this is another Blackboard functionality. Some people know about class conversations, uh, some do not. So I just wanted to throw this out here um, that, you know, there are some simple things that we can do, um, different features that we can um, activate to help our students. So class conversations, uh, these are different than discussion boards. And you'll find this under um, anything that has a gear icon setting. So this could be an assignment. It could be a discussion board. Um, it, it could be um, really just about anything that you can find in Blackboard. If you see that little gear icon in the top right corner, you'll um, have an opportunity to turn on class conversations. Class conversations are ungraded. It kind of emulates that feeling of being in a face-to-face -face class where you could you know, lean across the aisle and say, hey, what chapter was that in? Um, so class conversations is informal discussions. Uh, people can ask any question they want and anybody can respond. So you as the instructor could respond um, or somebody's peer could, you know, kind of respond to their comment or question. And if you've never used class conversations and you're wondering what it looks like, anytime somebody um, makes a comment or a question, it'll pop up as like a little purple conversation bubble. So um, if you see the conversation bubble here in the top right corner, it looks like that, but in purple. Oh, Michelle, I'm sorry. Yes, I, <laughs> I delivered the bad news. Uh, Flip has moved to Microsoft Teams for Education. Yeah, it was a recent development. I thought I'd heard about that. We can still help you come up with things. Uh, maybe VoiceThread. We could also do things like YellowDig as an interactive discussion board, and you can put videos in there. Um, so, so we could still come up with something, I promise. OK, had anybody ever seen conversations at all or, or tried using these? No? OK. Um, sometimes it's just a nice way to have that informal conversation flowing in your course. Um, I know sometimes um, instructors will set up um, you know, a, a discussion board, and they'll call it you know, like a water cooler conversation or something like that. Um, but this is just another option that you can enable on um, really any given item in your Blackboard course. So. Um, just another way to, to try to get that kind of back and forth, you know, conversation flowing in your course. And so this is, again, just another um, picture of how to find it. So if you're looking for it in your Blackboard course, um, remember, maybe open up an assignment or something like that. Um, look for that little gear icon in the top right corner. And then um, this is the setting that you'll see. You just click a little box that says allow class conversations. You've always clicked yes, but you've never seen students use it. Well, um, you know, that might be something that they don't know how to use. Um, I, I often think that for um, many of our students, they, they think they're very tech savvy because they're on their cell phones all the time, but you'd be surprised what they don't know about Blackboard. Um, so you may want to um, 
either include that in that you know optional synchronous session on the first day of class or um, in just one of those quick you know module introductions let them know that's a tool that's available Carrie I don't know if they know how to use it but they can't claim ignorance if if you give them a demonstration Now, somebody had mentioned earlier that they like to have class converse or um, class discussions with students. Um, and I, I see that there is a lot of debate uh, with instructors. You know, if I have a discussion board, should I chime in? Should I not chime in? I've seen a variety of answers. Uh, some instructors thought that to meet regular and substantive interaction, that they're obligated to respond to every single student. Um, some of you have some very large rosters of students and and to be able to respond to every single student, uh, that, that's almost a second job in and of itself. Um, so I, I don't think that it's necessary to respond to every single student. On the other hand, um, some instructors have said, well, I, I really want students to lead the discussion, so I shouldn't be chiming in. Well, if they think that you're not reading their discussions, then um, it may not be as high of a quality of discussion activity as you would like. So I think, again, finding that balance in there, um, it, it's trying to show them that, yes, I, I'm reading your posts, I'm engaged too, um, but you're not dominating the discussion boards. Great, Michelle. I will create a video with overall feedback at the end talking about trends, et cetera. That's great. And if you tell your students up front um, to expect that from you, then they know that you're, you know, you're taking notes on their activity as well. So I, I think it's all about, like you said, finding that balance. Like, yep, I'm I'm here, I'm paying attention. I, I found some really great, you know, either commentary or questions, and I want to expand on it. Um, just letting students know that. Um, you're also following their, their progress. This is a controversial topic as well, requiring office hours. So um, some people have asked, well, if I have, um, you know, virtual office hours and students can stop by to meet me, you know, every Monday between two to 4 p.m., does that meet regular and substantive interaction guidelines? No, unfortunately. Um, it's not regular and frequent, and that's why it doesn't meet um, regular and substantive interaction guidelines. However, if you ask students to periodically come to meet you during virtual office hours throughout the, the term or the semester, that would meet those guidelines. Um, you could ask students to come to your office hours early on in the course, um, just so you can talk to them about their expectations, um, maybe just meet with you for five to 10 minutes. You could also do things like throughout the course, maybe they should bring a draft of their project or their writing that they're working on. Um, so then you have an agenda for why they're coming to meet with you virtually. Um, so there are different ways to handle this. Um, it can be tricky because sometimes students um, have some, some wild uh, you know, schedules, but it is doable. I would encourage flexibility and give them a range of options for when they could meet with you um, and have a reason for why they're meeting with you. Um, you know, what are you going to discuss? So um, as an English instructor, I remember I used to do this with my students. I would ask them to bring an entire first rough draft and uh, they had to come up with a list of questions about it, you know, and I asked them things like, well, what was your strongest um, aspect of your writing? Where do you think you could improve? Um, and, and give them, you know, kind of that one-on-one -on -one personalized feedback. I had mentioned earlier that we were going to come back to this idea about distributing a survey, and I think many of you may already do this. Um, so these are kind of some of the sample questions that we may see with surveys for our students. Uh, there are different ways that you can submit or submit um, post surveys in your course. You could use Qualtrics. Um, you could even use a quiz functionality in Blackboard and make it worth you know zero or low stakes uh, amount of points. Um, so these are kind of some of the general questions, right? What are you most interested in learning about, or what needs to be clarified? Um, these are are good survey questions, um, particularly if, if you want to follow up with students after a lesson plan, right? Um, ask them what it, you know, what are you most interested about? You you just had a large, you know, 
reading assignment or I had you listen to a podcast, you know, what, do you, what intrigues you about the topic, um, what needs to be clarified. <laughs> I got to vote for Qualtrics, okay. <laughs> Um, but there are other survey options. And so um, if you are interested, I can share this uh, next slide with you. It's not actually a slide. So um, if any of you know Dr. Jason Rohde, he's our chief online learning officer at NIU. Um, he distributes through Google Forms a survey to his students um, at the very start of his course because he wants to know about them. And so this is just a screenshot. As you can see, he's got quite a few questions, um, but this is a way for him to learn more about uh, his students. You know, what are your, expect your expectations going into this course uh, for the course itself, the instructor, yourself, and your class uh, community of learners, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, he asked them some questions, you know, what, a, what characteristics, um, do you remember your favorite professor or teacher that helped you learn and grow as a student? Um, and then what characteristics, you know, do you recall about your least favorite professor that stunted your growth as a student? Yes. Um, what is your main motivation to succeed academically and socially? I think these are, you know, really asking some kind of deeper questions about um, what incentivizes our students? I, I don't think we want to assume that everybody is um, motivated by the same factor. So um, I did speak with Dr. Rohde and he has a link um, to this Google form. So if you like it, you can just make a copy of the, the survey and you could even distribute it to your students. Great, okay, so I've got a, a variety of things to <laughs> follow up with you um, after this workshop. Ooh, I see we're almost out of time. Um, very quickly here, supporting your students' learning. Remember I said some of these things, um, you don't have to exert a ton of um, pressure on yourself to, to help support your students. You can also just let them know that there are resources available. Um, and so this one is kind of one of my favorites. You may not know about it, or maybe your students don't know about it. When you log into Blackboard on the left side of the screen, you'll see this little rocket ship icon that says assist. Um, this is where all of the support resources for students are now housed. This could be career services, it could be counseling, it could be tutoring. Um, I think as an instructor, I, I always felt pressured to have to go and double check that I had current contact information for all of these departments. Um, and, and that was kind of stressful. But um, now it's all housed in one area and it's all up to date and current. So, um, you know, if your students need additional resources, just direct them to Blackboard Assist. Okay. With three minutes to spare, we have Q&A. Um, is there anything that I can try to answer for you or resources that you're looking for? Yes, Michelle. <laughs> okay, well, I, I see a hand raised. Uh, let me know if that was intentional or not. Um, Carrie asked how to thread the needle with requiring cameras on or off. Um, be upfront about it. I, I definitely think you want to have um, a syllabus statement about it. Some students are okay with it, some are not. Um, I try to remember that some of them may have children in the background. Um, some of them may not want to share their home environment. So um, just be upfront um, and let your students know from day one your expectations about cameras on or off. Um, I, I don't necessarily require them, but I, I know different people have different expectations and different experiences. So again, not a one size fits all approach. And on that note, I really do think it's helpful um, to tell your students things like, it's not okay to sign into a synchronous class, um, you know, while you're driving. So um, <laughs> have that conversation with your students too. Um, just know your comfort level and try to convey it early on. 
All right, I, I see some requests for a copy of the survey. So um, I'm going to send that follow-up email with um, some of these resources. I'll be happy to put it in there. Ooh, you've started offering extra credit for cameras on. That's a great idea. I've had students tell me that, you know, oh, I, I really want to turn my camera off so I can eat dinner at the same time. <laughs> and that makes sense to me too. So, um, you know, play around with it. Uh, maybe only ask them to turn it on for specific occasions. Um, there, there's a lot of variables that you could play with. Yes, uh, sometimes people freeze. Uh, one of my colleagues is um, actually over in Australia now, and it's just kind of become a, a blanket, you know, statement from her. I'm sorry, I'm going to turn my camera off because it's going to be frozen anyway. Yes, as long as they don't sign in with the cameras off and then walk away from the class. Um, I call on people. I'm not, I'm not shy about it. Um, if anybody has ever played around with it, you can do a Google search for a random name selector. It's like Wheel of Fortune, um, but you type in your student's name and it lands on a name. Um, and then I'm, I'm not at fault for, um, you know, kind of focusing on one student. Um, it's just whatever name it landed on. But, you know, I could spin the wheel and if I land on Carrie, I could ask Carrie if, uh, a question about the reading. All right, well, I'm happy to stick around, but I know many of you have other obligations. So um, thank you for attending and I'll be sure to follow up. Thanks everybody. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and close the session.